I'm thrilled to introduce our panelists today. Um, joining us, we have uh, Sri Krishnamurti. Sri is the founder of uh, Quant University, an AI advisory and quantitative analysis company specializing in large scale machine learning and AI solutions focused on adoption of responsible AI products in the industry. Uh, prior to starting Quant University, Sri uh, has worked at Citigroup, Endeka, MathWorks, and with more than 25 customers in the financial services and energy industries. He has trained more than 10,000 students in quantitative methods, analytics, and big data in the industry and at Babson College, Northeastern University, and Holt International Business School. Uh, also joining us today is Karen Boyd. Karen is an economist at the San Diego Workforce Partnership, studying the influence of local factors on job quality and quantity in a dynamic job market. She earned an MBA from the Rady School of Management at the University of California, San Diego, and a PhD in information studies at the University of Maryland, College Park, where she studied and designed a tool to support eth ethically sensitive, ethical sensitivity among machine learning engineers. Uh, her postdoc at the University of Michigan focused on the contextual ethical impacts of automated emotion recognition designed for the monitoring, uh, monitoring current and prospective employees. Her goal is to understand and support flourishing in the future of work. And last but certainly not least, we have Patrick Hall, uh, Patrick is a principal scientist at BNH AI, a DC-based law firm specializing in AI and data analytics. Patrick also serves as a visiting faculty at the George Washington uh, University School of Business. Prior to co-founding BNH AI, Patrick led responsible AI efforts at the machine learning software for firm H2O AI, where his work resulted in one of the world's first commercial solutions for explainable and fair machine learning. Um, I'm so excited to hear from all of you. Uh, and so I'm gonna kick off this discussion by asking you all, why is ML documentation important and necessary for any organization? Um, I would say that, that first and foremost, um, documentation is important for accountability. Uh, ever, ever since we were little kids in grade school, we had to put our name on our papers. And um, if you're developing a machine learning system that's going to be making decisions about lots of people and potentially highly impactful decisions, uh, I think the only professional option is to sign your name to your work so that there, if there are maintenance issues, incident response issues, um, compliance or legal issues that follow up, that it's easy for people to get in touch with you. Um, so I'll leave it there and leave room for, for other panelists. But for me, uh, documentation is, is fundamentally about accountability, which is fundamentally about uh, decreasing consumer and public harm in the use of machine learning systems. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I'll just kind of step back a little bit, uh, you know, just to ensure that we are all on the same page. You know, as we are evolving this new field of machine learning, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think many of the best practices are there in the industry for a really long time. I started out as a mechanical engineer and uh, the first company I worked for was for building a hydraulic excavator. And as you can imagine, a hydraulic excavator would have thousands of parts. And uh, back in the day, there were no online documentation for all these parts. We had to go to this huge catalog of parts and kind of intricately figure out each one of the you know machine level details of what the materials were used, who was the manufacturer, what was the bill of materials, how can you kind of replace one part uh, with another, how do you version those, how do you kind of you know go from one machine to another machine, uh, and also maintenance manuals and how do you maintain these machines and how do you use these machines when you buy a car. You know, you get uh, this thick book, which probably no one reads, obviously, but you do get this book, which basically says that here are all the things about your particular car, right? So uh, we are now kind of increasing the amount of complexity in machine learning models. And we are basically moving from input, processing unit, output, 
to building out exhausting pipelines. And these pipelines are running on the cloud, have so many dependencies, have so many people working on these. And documentation is just common sense, just to make sure that everybody is aligned with the goal of making this whole product successful and does what it's supposed to do. And in you know, making sure that you know, the risk aspects of this particular model have been factored in, you have kind of delegated responsibility to this model to make decisions. So how do you make sure that you are building the due diligence along the way through the process of designing this, building it, testing it, deploying it, using it. So making sure that you're factoring in all the phases of your product life cycle, and then making sure that you are doing an engineering in a good way is basically common sense is what I would say. <clears throat> um, I agree with everything that these folks have already said. Um, I think documentation can support a ton of different organizational goals in addition to those, right? Like efficiency and continuity and these kinds of things. My main personal interest is in ethics. I think um, it's also difficult to disentangle ethics from quality um, and that documentation can support both of those goals um, very well. I do think, I agree that we have a lot of, of sort of historical, well, historical is probably the wrong word, but we have existing best practices for documentation in other fields. And I think it's especially important in the case of machine learning because of the complexity, opacity, um, additional potential for hidden technical debt um, within machine learning systems that makes it as much or more important to do um, documentation in machine learning. Yeah, those are all really, uh, really important points, you know, around increasing accountability, um, reducing risks, uh, building due diligence and, you know, supporting uh, various organizational goals as Karen mentioned too, in addition to those. Um, I'm curious uh, what specific benefits uh, any of you have seen um, or experienced from the adoption of ML documentation in your field? Yeah, so I, I can get uh, started there. And uh, obviously, Patrick and I, we have collaborated on various initiatives. So he'll probably, you know, uh, kind of add to that. So uh, most of the experiences I've kind of had in the machine learning space is applied in finance, which is, you know, an industry, as you all know, uh, deals with real money and you know the stakes are really really high you have the fiduciary responsibility and you want to make sure that you know you're building systems which can support responsibility and in, in the whole uh, in the whole workflow right now uh, one of the big things which we don't often talk about or start with is risk management and you know the question of how do you make sure that you're factoring what could potentially go wrong. And G was mentioning about the AI incident database, you know, wherein we talk about the things which could potentially go wrong after the fact when something has gone wrong. But in the financial services industry, you have very little leeway of going wrong, right? So you've got to make sure that you test adequately, you document your systems well, and you make sure that you have done your due diligence before you deploy any trading or any other you know, systems in development. So I think risk management is one of the most important places where I've seen exhaustive documentation come in. And there are formal roles in the financial industry, risk managers who are meant to make sure that the various stakeholders are ensuring that the systems are designed and documented well. Um, in the context of machine learning, and you know, as we have seen the maturity in the industry, we are now talking about not just building models, we're talking about engineering processes. And there are some of the best practices about things like reproducibility. You know, how do you make sure that a developer sitting and working on a laptop can basically articulate all the key aspects of the recipe so that the IT department can reproduce it, scale it and deploy it in a, in a cloud environment, right? So that's one way you would wanna make sure that you're translating your recipes and making it available. To another uh, place. And also, when we do audits, so when we look at companies on how they're building out systems, one of the things we look at is enterprise readiness. Because as you know, there is a lot of, a lot of startups are working on machine learning products, and they may have really cool ideas, but the question of how ready are these in production use cases? And with the open source uh, driven economy today, everything 
you want to build will have an open source option. And the question becomes, how can you trust something which has been built out, whether it's enterprise ready? And documentation is one way of looking at how good the product would be, especially from an enterprise readiness perspective. I'm gonna, there's gonna be a pattern in my responses, which is that my work is largely scoped on ethics. So I'm gonna keep returning to that theme. Um, but in addition to, um, I think a, a lot of the motivation for these documents is to inform, right? To inf like one person has built something or gathered some data or whatever it is, and they're conveying that information directly to them. But another thing that I've seen these um, documents do is surface what is important or what is seen, convey what is seen as important or what is seen as part of your task. Um, and I, being able to do that with ethics is very important. A lot of times ethics is not seen as part of the scope of an engineer's job because it's outside of the requirements or you know whatever, however they convey that um, task. And doc documentation that includes ethical considerations can alter that perception. And I would speculate that that is true for other aspects of documentation as well besides ethics. I'll add, you know, not not to be adversarial, but but to inject like a level of realism here. Um, people don't care about risk, and generally speaking, right? And people hate to prioritize risk. People underestimate risk, um, and especially in the go fast and break things world of of sort of I don't know. I mean, I bluntly call it amateur data science. Um, you know, people have been essentially programmed to take major risk without even thinking about it. And so, you know, until you get burned with, you know, losing $300 million in cash and then, you know, another 10 billion in stock valuation or after call 12,000 vehicles because the self-driving system is messed up or, you know, experience vast public backlash and, you know, all kinds of regulatory saber rattling, then very likely, you know, the people at the lowest levels, the, the people who are need to be typing the documentation for the most part are, are not going to be incentivized to do that. And, and unfortunately that's just human nature or, or has shown to be human nature in the tech field for a long time. And so I, I think it's important to address that, that issue that um, documentation may never be fun or exciting for, for data scientists, but you know, I, I, I don't see that as a problem at all. A data scientist is simply an individual contributor in an IT organization, generally speaking, and there should be policies that mandate they fill out the appropriate level of, of documentation. Like there's there's no magic here. There's, there's no, you know, and, and again, I mean, to inject a level of realism, I think there's way too much entitlement around the position of data scientists, right? Um, you're being paid, generally speaking, like you're getting paid at the same level of a, of a practicing physician or attorney or, you know, civil engineer and 95% of the field feels it's beneath them to write down what they did that day. And, and so I, I think it's really important to tackle these sort of cultural um, and, and human issues directly. And, and so that's why I bring them up in the beginning of this conversation. Uh, can I share a story? I, uh, I was too I would like to share. Uh, this uh, was eight years ago. I was working for a company and uh, we got this frantic call from one of our customers and uh, not to be named. Uh, you know, we were told like, you know, uh, uh, we need you immediately because two of our quants who are building systems have resigned on the same day. So we had hired two quants because one was the backup for another and they both had resigned on the same day. Until then, they were basically relying on each other for all the processes to go well. And now since they are leaving and there was, no, there was no plan to get a replacement in 15 days, how do we make sure that we basically take all the things they've been doing over the past many, many years and write down documentation because they're gonna be leaving in two weeks and make sure that there is something for the next team who's gonna be picking up their roles so that they can build up on what these guys have already been building. So I went down and spent two weeks basically doing what was called as like a job study, basically looking at what they were doing. How do they move the data from one place to another? Where do they store it? How do they share it? How do they kind of you know, go from one step to another? And I was kind of writing down frantically all the things they were doing. 
And uh, you know, Patrick was mentioning about, you won't think about risk till something bad happens, right? So this was their aha moment wherein they would think like, well, okay, we've got to prioritize documentation because now we are seeing why things could potentially go wrong. And uh, within two weeks, we captured as much as possible, but that's not, that was not fun. I mean, we were basically asking questions which were so basic and we didn't even know, like, you know, why are you dragging this from this folder to this other folder? It's like, well, that's what I've always been doing. It's like, can't we just write a process to do it? And then there's like, yeah, but we didn't have the time. So stories like those are abundant in the industry. And when people leave and, you know, people kind of, you know, and they talk about the benefits of documentation, we won't be able to quantify it as an ROI, but these aspects will be there in systems and the way, and I talked about enterprise readiness, right? So enterprise readiness is what is your backup plan if something goes wrong? If the whole department is gonna go on a vacation, who's gonna be maintaining these systems? So all those things should be considered as we are developing these large scale systems. I wanted to briefly um, plus one what Patrick said about policy being important for, for compliance here um, and at like add a little compliment of hope in that like we do require physicians to document their work pretty extensively in their, in health records and the same with lawyers right like they're billing their time down to like minutes um, and I can in fact we talk in my organization occasionally we have to bill our time right but um, my boss is always saying you know oh we you know we're not lawyers we don't have to count like you know it's a it's a tedious thing to do and it does feel like what, like I have all of this expertise, why am I being tasked with this thing that feels sort of administrative or something? Um, but I think there is evidence in other professions that we can convey the importance of that documentation. Yeah. Um, with, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, I think responsibility is I think a really good, um, and like tying it, at least maybe this, uh, I would say this is not as supported as other things I've said, but not as strong as speculation. I do think that there's a strong value in the professional sort of culture of quality. And the more that we can tie um, documentation or, or other things that we think are important to quality goals, um, the sort of more motivation we can um, incur. Yeah. And I mean, I, I just add, come on, think about it. Uh, I go, you can't go to Walmart and buy a microwave oven that costs whatever they cost now, you know, like whatever the cheapest microwave oven is. You can't buy that without documentation, right? And people are spending millions of dollars to create systems that, um, you know, that, that have a high impact on different people's lives and they need to be documented. I mean, it's it, it, for me, it's it's that simple. There's all kinds of reasons, right? There's ethical reasons, there's process reasons, there's technical reasons. Um, but but I just like to point that out. And I mean, and just, and just to add to sort of the, the obvious nature of this, like if my kid falls off the daycare and my kid falls off the slide at daycare, I get a better incident report than I do when uh, you know client companies or companies that are that are in the public eye, you know produce when they when they engage in some kind of behavior with AI that creates tremendous amounts of harm and tremendous amounts of reputational and financial losses for themselves you know and and so so I, I don't know I, I'm having been a practicing data scientist for the last 10 years I, I I'm just tired of of the sort of entitlement culture around data scientists there, there's no reason that they shouldn't be writing model documentation there, there just isn't Those are all really uh, good points. I, I really appreciate, you know, the you, you all highlighting the cultural and, you know, human issues perspective of, of this question, and also the importance of policy for compliance. And actually, you know, what Patrick, what you were just saying kind of leads into my next question around, you know, what are the costs? What are the costs, um, you know, associated with implementing ML documentation? when you're looking at, you know, the cost of uh, developing and implementing a policy uh, for uh, various stakeholders that are going to interact with that, that documentation process. I, I have a, a short and direct answer here that, that I'll jump in with and then let the other panelists chime in. Essentially, 
government co governance cost, including the you know the the cost in terms of time and resources um, to generate documentation, should be aligned with the the risk or materiality of of the system. And so, if it's a high materiality system or a high cost, high risk system, then you should spend proportionally on governance and risk control. Um, if it's a low risk system, then you know maybe just do a short little model card, move on with your life, something like that. These, to his point, that these folks, time is are expensive, right? Like that, we pay them a lot. It's expensive, and they also don't want to do it, right? Like, or, you know, in some cases, I would imagine it's not as it's not what they signed up to do. It's not the exciting part that they trained for. It's like this sort of it feels like this additional task somehow. Um, and there's maybe some less tangible cost to that, but certainly their time is a big one. Yeah, so my perspective is, and I just go back to my days as an engineer, you know, uh, you cannot basically attribute specific aspects to documentation and say, okay, this is the cost of the product. This is the cost of the documentation. So what is discretionary at this point, right? So we got to integrate documentation as a part of the whole process. And I think that's, that's where, when you build in the culture within the organization, I remember, you know, back in the day when we were training co-ops on our jobs and co-ops would come in and they had no, you know, industry experience and they would write the code and documentation would always be an afterthought. You know, you would kind of say, okay, so is it ready for production? And say, yes, well, where's the documentation? And say, oh, let me just write it down for you. And then we will take like 15 minutes to write it down. And that was the culture we were in. We said, no, 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 you, you got to integrate documentation. You got to put in your function handles. You got to put in your documentation before you actually write the code. And that basically provided an arena wherein we were actively partnering with stakeholders to make sure that we're understanding what they're doing, how they're doing it. So it just becomes a part of the culture that you're building robust products and you're proud of what you're building because mm -hmm. you're not kind of you know building something wherein you would say, okay, I'll just move on to the next thing because this is not interesting for me or documentation is somebody else's job or should we delegate it to you know, the lowest uh, person in the hierarchy saying, okay, we hired an intern or we, we have this person who's dedicated to do documentation. I don't think it should be the way we need to think about it. We have to think about it as how do we kind of build in that culture wherein it's easier to kind of integrate the documentation aspects of it along the way. I will note, I think that that carries through from training as well, right? Like we don't, many, I think, I guess, I don't know yeah, if this is always true. Point. Many professors aren't requiring or people on, you know, a Coursera course, however you're <laughs> building that expertise, it, it, it's not part of that assignment, right? Yeah. And well, it's, it's like an extra part, I guess. And I completely agree. And I think as educational institutions, uh, we had to build in that culture among students. And I mean, in my class, when I teach a course, I basically say, well, the teaching assistant will be reproducing exactly what you had done with the documentation you provide. And if they are not able to reproduce it, then you're not gonna get the full grade. Yeah. And that makes the incentive for students to basically write down the, all the pieces of the documentation and how to reproduce the process uh, to make sure that they can at least get the grade. That's my I'd, I'd love to jump in here on the education, but I, I don't want to cut you off, Karen. No, no, I was just um, saying that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah so, so in my teaching, I also emphasize documentation because it, you know, in, in my training as a, as a data scientist, I was never told to document anything. I mean, I, I was just told to ruthlessly maximize some accuracy objective on training and test data, which actually makes no sense. It, that's not a valid way to solve problems. Uh, to be blunt, in, in the real world anyway. It, it works nicely on Kaggle and machine learning contests, but it's not the way the problems are solved in the real world. Um, and so, you know, to, to kind of make, say something more positive here, I'd say that, you know, to, to echo some of the comments I heard earlier, documentation can lead to better models, right? Because machine learning, I don't care if it's GPT-3 or whatever trillion weight new thing, you know, is built, has no understanding of context, zero. And we have to be realistic about that. Humans are the only people are the only entities that we're aware of that understand the context in which machine learning systems operate. 
And so that context is a very crucial part of what's documented, right? And it should be like, like in, a, in a model car that's right up at the top, right? The, the intended use. And, you know, domain experts or compliance, oversight professionals, whoever it is, should be able to read that, um, you know, intended use statement and very quickly have an, an idea of whether it's clear and focused and actually provides value. Um, and if, if the if the techniques are matched to the context appropriately. Um, and, and then I'd also add, you know, Sri brought up reproducibility. Um, if it's not reproducible, I'm just not sure what it is. I, I certainly don't want to use it. Um, not that big companies making important decisions aren't, aren't using models that have reproducibility problems, but, um, you know, I, documentation is very helpful for reproducibility as well. And, and so documentation can lead to better models, but, you know, if you've been educated just to go for accuracy and your whole world is sort of medium and Kaggle, um, it's not going to make any sense to you. And, and you're going to be like, well, I'm just supposed to get higher on the leaderboard. Um, I'm not supposed to be spending time on documentation. So, so yeah, ed education in this field is, is way behind the curve. I mean, I, I, I do what I can, I'm, I'm not sure how well I do, but um, yeah, it, education key point and then that, that model documentation can actually lead to better models if you're willing to switch your your mindset out of the sort of Kaggle playground mindset I wonder if I think it is worth noting that there are cases in which opacity is strategic both for the organization in the case of intellectual property right like Facebook isn't going to explain how their algorithm works because other companies will, reproduce it or Google the same thing. Um, but I think that that is also true on an individual level. I might imagine, you know, I brought a bunch of effort and experience and education to this task. I understand how it works. And if they want to use my work, they have to continue employing me, right? Um, now, I don't think that's something that we, that is like um, an unqualified good. I just think it's worth acknowledging that there is some um there are cases in which opacity is strategic that's all i want to say that's a really interesting point um and actually not one that i have heard in a conversation before that often um i'm curious um how you would all evaluate the maturity of documentation within an organization? I'll take a stab at it. You know, we just recently um, completed the validation of a model. So we were, as a third party independent validator, basically got access to the entire model and we were uh, looking at pieces of how the whole thing was laid out. So I use a very simple framework. I call it the four five framework. And the four things I look for first is how was it designed? You know, how is it developed? How was it tested? And how is it being deployed? I mean, common steps which you would normally do in building out any software products. And is there documentation associated with each one of these? And this basically tells you know, what their process of development is, how are they designing it, how are they testing it, and also shows the maturity in the context of, are they cognizant enough that this is a process which is repeatable, they have things in place, they're not just writing it for a third-party validator, it's something which is a part of their process. When I ask the question, if they say, okay, here's the documentation, it just shows that they already know that it's important and they have it in place. And where does the five come in? The five thing is, the things I look at, data, because these are machine learning models, these are data-driven models. So you need to have a real clear idea of what data you're using, how are you gathering it, what are the processes associated with it, how are you storing it, and the whole nine yards with respect to data. The second one is the modeling framework itself. It's not about your final answer about which model you're using and how you're using it. It's about what were your design decisions before you gravitated towards this neural network model? What are the alternative considerations do you have? And what are the, are the surrogate models have you considered? And what are your uh, choices along the way? The third thing is the process of the pipeline, which is 
as you know, machine learning models are not just going to be, I mean, I think Google has a fantastic paper, um, uh, which I'll put a link to in a bit. Uh, there they talk about like, you know, what is the place of the model? And they basically show this entire landscape and model is only a really small bit because you have so many other processes involved with that. And we are building these intricate pipelines nowadays. So what is your entire pipeline for building out the whole thing? And the fourth thing is the environment. You know, where will this be used? Is it going to be running on my watch? Is it going to be running on the edge or somewhere? It's going to be running on the cloud or it's going to be running on servers. That's going to be completely different from what the developer was building on, which is probably his or her laptop, right? So how do you kind of you know, factor in the reproducible environments? You know, are using microservices? What's the whole thing? And the fifth one Patrick mentioned, which is context. You know, what is the, the soundness and where is this model going to be used? And where was this model designed to be used? And in what the particular domain and what are the uh, applicabilities for specific use cases? So the context is the most important piece and you basically articulate those. So those, those, that's like a very simple framework we use, a four or five framework which basically tells about you know, how mature is the process within an organization. I, I'd add that um, outside, of, outside of very large financial services companies, um, I, I don't have as much experience with big tech companies, but I do have some experience with big tech companies. Um, I, I would say that model documentation is pretty immature, generally speaking, right? And I think that goes along with some of the, the results of, of GU's research. Um, and, and so I, you know, just, just keep that in mind as well. I think, I think that, that many different, but machine learning's weird. Machine learning's weird. Machine learning's extremely mature in financial services. It's, ex, it's extremely mature in big tech. It's extremely mature in, in certain deep parts of national security and the government, but everywhere else, it's just kind of the wild west. Like it, it's just this very new thing that, that, you know, people understand to varying degrees. Um, and so out in that whole sort of wild west part of the economy, uh, I, I'd say that, that modern documentation is, is generally speaking very immature. And, and that, that's one reason why that AI incident database just keeps getting more and more full. Yeah, for sure. Uh, anything to add, Karen, before we go on to the next question? This isn't an area of my expertise, so I, I wouldn't have much to say on it. No worries. Oh, I think I think one one important thing to say, and, and Shri can jump in here. Sorry, sorry to cut you off before we move on, is that it it's really common for like like model cards is really a um, kind of minimal framework. It, it's really common in consumer finance to see model documents that are you know anywhere between fifty and I mean I've, I've heard of I've never seen but I've heard of up to like fifteen hundred pages. Um, and, and we might question the, the efficiency of, of such long documents and why they're necessary, but um, you know, ju just to paint a picture of, of what's going on, I mean, there are data scientists at big banks today that know they have to write a 50 to 100 page document about whatever model they're building, and it's just part of their job. Um, and, and I would say that, that there are other places that are just as high risk as finance where, where this isn't happening at all yet. Yeah. All right, I mean, I have... I... No, it's good. No, no. I just wanted to reiterate that point wherein um, it's not uncommon in the, in, in the, at least in the financial industry, wherein you have uh, elaborate documentation. And uh, of course, we don't have everybody following everything, but that shows the maturity of an organization because, you know, you show that you're not just doing it because you have to do it or someone is asking you to do it. It's more of a cultural aspect wherein you are basically documenting every piece of the puzzle, which goes along towards not only building, maintaining, deploying, but also kind of, you know, doing the due diligence later. And uh, Karen, you can probably attest to this, you know, you talked about ethics, right? So if there isn't a question in the whole design life cycle about what are the ethical considerations. No one's gonna proactively answer that or no one's gonna actively document it. 
But as a part of the process, if there is a consideration which you're factoring in, then that becomes a part of the discussion and becomes documented on what were the considerations and what did you do with respect to that. And it goes with the same thing for things like explainability, fairness, what aspects need to be monitored? How do you assess the risk of you know, something bad happening? What is the recourse if something if someone reports that, oh, I'm being discriminated against by this particular model, how are you going to even test it or even acknowledge it? And how are you going to act upon it? And who are the responsible folks in the whole ecosystem who are answerable to those kinds of questions? Is it always going to be the data scientist who is building out the models? Or is there a governance role? Is there a framework? And at a policy level, how are you kind of enforcing the whole thing? So there is a cost, right? So you asked about the cost earlier, Sarah. You know, it, it's an organization level decision to say what kind of infrastructure we're going to put in place, especially for high risk products, especially when you have build, you're building consumer products which can reach millions and millions of people. And that's where uh, you have to make sure that you engineer the process uh, at the cost of you know, even including parts of it which may be burdensome initially. But you make that consideration along the way because every model will not be you know, required to follow the same process, but you need to have a way of making sure that you delineate what is absolutely necessary and what's, what are the things which are discretionary so that you can follow that as a process rather than kind of inventing something along the way. I just wanted to add a couple of aspects of maturity that came up as you guys were talking. Um, and also to note that because I don't have experience assessing maturity, these are going to be somewhat a contextual that you can interpret how you like. Um, there's sort of two um, features that come to mind. One is how integrated is that is documentation with a larger process, right? So um, as I was doing a literature review on this topic, I found a handful that are that look like documentation or include documentation, but are a larger process within an organization or a um, regulatory body that's rather than being modeled, for example, on um, a nutrition label are modeled on environmental reporting, right? Um, it's like include that use that documentation in a larger process. And the other thing is along the pipeline or maybe more of a, the life cycle of machine learning, um, what points does it assess things at, right? Is it, are you mostly looking at a model? Are you really just looking at training data? Are you looking at both? Are you also talking about sort of documenting your process for training? And do you, what sort of implications does your documentation have for how the thing will be used? Sort of like the, the little packet that comes with your microwave, right? Do you have that um, documentation that speaks to how it should be deployed? Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> And uh, you know we've uh, you have all alluded to this um, throughout our conversation so far, uh, but I'm curious, you know, what are the specific risks or harms of not implementing documentation practices in uh, either the short term or the long term? Well, as as Karen pointed out, documentation is just this like very broad transparency control. Um, and so I think it's hard, it's hard to tie any one specific risk to a lack of documentation. Um, but I mean, the, the way I kind of say this is um, transparency enables testing and debugging and governance. Um, we can govern and test black boxes. It's not impossible. Um, that, but, but part of that is documenting those black boxes. I'm not, I'm not a proponent of using black boxes, especially for any high impact use case, but, but I know people do. Um, so, you know, I, I just say that, you know, may, hopefully maybe, maybe, uh, Shri and, and Karen will, will, will spur some smarter thought, but, but I would just say, you know, it, it's this very important general risk control. And we have a lot of very important and general risk in machine learning. Um, that and and so it's just this important sort of review step, kind of to have people think about what's going on and have people think about any sort of unintended consequences or unforeseen risk that, that uh, could occur. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> 
Yeah, one thing I would like to add to that, Patrick, is um, of, uh, you mentioned about the risk controls aspect of it, right? So I see documentation as more of, you know, rather than just considering it as um, a part of the whole thing which needs to be there, it's more of an indicator of how risky the process is. If you do not have documentation, and you're running a process which is very complicated, it just basically shows that there is high risk in the system. So a lack of documentation will be considered as a risk indicator for your whole process, right? And if there is adequate documentation, no, no one's gonna say that, oh, this is too much documentation. We have never heard that in the industry saying, oh my goodness, for such a small model, we have so much documentation and it's, I mean, people may complain that it's a lot of work and everything, but we have never had that problem wherein we got to cut down documentation, right? It's always the lack of documentation. And that becomes something which we have to think about. Well, if it's a, a process which is high risk, many people are gonna be affected and the impacts are gonna be you know, severe, it is mandatory that we need to have documentation, right? So when you do your cost assessment, when you do your risk assessment for your process, if you find that you know, there is something which, uh, which could potentially go wrong, you, know, you need to have what could potentially go wrong, how are we testing for it? How are you gonna address even if, despite putting all the mitigation and controls in the, in the financial world, we call it what's called as residual risk. So you basically do a risk assessment, right? And you basically say, here are the risks which are associated with the model. And then you say, well, what are the mitigation and controls? So mitigation could be, oh, I'm gonna be putting these band-aids. I'm gonna have human in the loop. I'm gonna have this additional layer of controls. Um, so I'm gonna take care of those risks which are potentially assessed so that I'm gonna say that this risk level is gonna come down because of my mitigation and controls. But you still have residual risk. Right. So what are you going to do when that residual risk shows up? And that's because the models do not have uniform data to train itself with, with all possibilities in the world. And something will happen. And what do you have in terms of process to build um, things up? So I think that assessment that needs to happen needs to factor the costs and the harms which could potentially um, you know, be there when, when something bad happens. And that basically becomes an impetus for a stronger push towards robust documentation. I can highlight an example of, a, of an occasion for risk that came up in my work, which is um, data sharing, either between uh, from one organization to the next on something like OpenML or within an organization for data that's collected for one purpose, for example, for quality control, that then gets sort of, oh, look, we've got this data. Do you think you could you know, either add this to your ML model or make, you know, there's, there is a bit of, of hype in um, among, uh, I mean, all kinds of people, especially in these less mature um, domains that, we, um, that Patrick was talking about a moment ago, sort of like, oh, I bet ML could fix this problem we have. Like, let me throw this QA data or this marketing data or the sales data or whatever, data we had that was collected for another reason and without documenting what features are there how are they collected why were they collected that way what are they measured by um people's assumptions and sort of beliefs of like well if i was collecting this data of course i would collect it in this way or for this reason or with this measure um and without conveying that um you have the risk of just being completely wrong in addition to the, um, or, you know, having way, way higher risk band, like um, yeah. uh, co bigger confidence intervals than you are aware that you have. <laughs> I, I think I, I'm gonna key into your, what you said, being completely wrong, okay? And, and so, um, you know, I, I think machine learning models are machine learning models, right? They're, they're pretty accurate and can be decent predictors if, if we, you know, target them the right way and get the right data. Um, but that is about context and only people understand context. Um, so people have to be involved in sort of pointing the machine learning in the exact right direction or else you can be completely wrong. Um, and so again, like I think it's about operating context. Uh, and I think documentation keys oversight personnel into potential red flags of oper you know, in, in operation context. Um, and just, just to give an example, and, and I can't tie it to documentation at all, but, but um, you know, th there was a really interesting incident and scary incident 
a couple years back, maybe last year, um, where mapping apps were sending California drivers into forest fires because there was no traffic there. And, you know, so, so that is like when we allow machine learning systems to operate in a very broad context, like, like, you know, Shri and I, you know, grew up building models that, that were like predict credit default, you know, predict home equity line of credit default in the state of California in the prime market between these months. Like that was the mission statement, attack that problem. Machine learning does a great job at, at problems when they're that defined and you can get good data. Um, when you say, tell people where to drive or just chat with people on the internet, um, that's when documentation becomes even more important because we need more human eyes and different kinds of human eyes, both demographic, professionally, education, background. We just need more human eyes to catch these bad problems like sending people into the middle of forest fires because there's no traffic there. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll shut back up. I just want to add one more thing, um, which is the importance of testing because you know, history has happened only once and we have you know, the record of what has happened in the past and we train our models with what has happened in the past. But we are predicting, we are building models for the future. And in the future, so many more scenarios are gonna come in, which the model has never seen. And as Patrick was mentioned, you know, uh, was mentioning, we are gonna be sending cars towards less dense areas, irrespective of whether there's forest fire or not, right? So that is where we have to make sure that the documentation factors in testing. And you know, we preach about like you know, stress testing, scenario testing, what if analysis, all those are test cases which you document and you basically put out, you know, all these are things which we can, and now that the field is maturing, we are learning from the cybersecurity field and we are building out like you know, machine learning security tests, looking at data poisoning attacks, evasion attacks, model extraction attacks, model stealing attacks which are threats which the developer has not designed the system for to address. And that becomes either a systems issue wherein, oh, I'm getting a lot of traffic from this particular IP address. What are they trying to do? Why are they calling the, our model so many times? Is it a denial of service attack or are they trying to steal the model? But if you haven't even thought about that, then that incident is gonna happen. And then you're gonna be looking at, well, how can we mitigate that particular thing? So some proactive, aspects about, you know, prevention needs to be thought about. And that's that's kind of, you know, learning lessons, like, you know, what we do with the why, right? So when you're teaching swimming to kids, we basically don't let them do all the things and then teach them like, look, this is what's gonna happen. We basically tell them, if you do not do this, this is potentially gonna happen. So you gotta train yourselves to learn the best practices and be aware of what could potentially go wrong and then address those scenarios when it comes there. <laughs> I would just agreed and I would note that it's as hard as it is to predict the perspectives and interpretation of people who are just coming from a different background than you or who are working on a different project than you imagined your data being used for your model being used for predicting the behavior of people who are actively trying to work against your purposes is also is very like bad actors it's very challenging to do. Yeah. And in many ways, and sometimes it could also be, you know, ignorance. You know, I remember back in the day, it's not a machine learning example. When I just joined as an engineer, this hydraulic excavator manufacturing company, you know, I was expected to go and like note down all the things which happens in uh, the shop floor. And this was what was called as a phosphating plant wherein these phosphating chemicals were processing these metal parts and stuff. And I would like observe the whole thing at the end of it, the worker would pick up all this phosphating sludge, put them in plastic bins and put it outside. And it was raining heavily and it was overflowing and flooding the whole area. And I noted exactly what was happening and they took it back to my manager. And my manager said, well, why is there overflow of phosphating sludge? And then I said, well, that was what was happening here. And there was no process on how do we safely dispose of the phosphating sludge. And when the rain happened and they saw all the waste, and they're like, oh, we don't have a process. So analogy there, but that's gonna happen in the machine learning world too. You know, the incident database is gonna grow and we're gonna realize, oh, we gotta like put in bridges to make sure that that never happens again. I think Tree, Tree uh, you know, got into something really important here, which I'll highlight, which is documentation templates um, 
But if you, if you really want to know how mature an organization is when it comes to responsible AI, ask them for their documentation templates. Okay, not, not just their model, you know, not the documentation for a handful of models that they built. Show me the document that contains the template for all of your documentation processes. But, but you know, really what Tree said that, that sort of triggered my comments here is that documentation templates walk practitioners through best practices. And that's a really key aspect of all this. They also are evidence and accountability when practitioners fail to uh, participate in best practices, right? Like they just leave that part of the model document blank. Some attorney or oversight personnel might rightly want to know why one day. Um, and, and so, you know, documentation is so intertwined with process um, that, that that's just another really important aspect of this that, that I wanted to make sure was drawn out in this conversation and, you know, credit Tree with bringing it up, but documentation and documentation templates walk technical practitioners through best practice processes and can indicate when they fail to follow best practices, which is extraordinarily important from that uh, personal accountability point I brought up in the beginning, especially given in the in the U.S. It, it you know sadly it looks to be that, that AI machine learning will be regulated through European regulation and a patchwork of, of state regs for for the foreseeable future. Um, personal accountability becomes even more important. Yeah, that's a hugely important point about uh, templates for sure. Uh, appreciate you bringing that up. Um, so, so far in this conversation, I feel like we've talked a lot about risks and costs, um, but I want to switch gears a little bit and ask, you know, how ML documentation can be implemented in a way that generates value for specific stakeholders, such as engineers, uh, management, or executives in companies. So, Sri, your, your story earlier at the beginning of our discussion about the two quants quitting on the same day, um, you know, what, what value would have been generated there if there had been documentation, right, for example, um, but very open to hearing uh, all your thoughts on, on this question. Yeah, I think there is the whole area, I mean, as we are educating our customers about how to use all these patchwork of products which we are building, I mean, uh, I was looking at this uh, ML ops ecosystem chart and it had like, you know, 5,000 different bullets of all these potential products out there. I think the industry is demanding more and more maturity in terms of how companies build and deliver products. And documentation becomes an important part of the puzzle. And open source initially was the go-to place because you do not want to spend money on enterprise products. But now there's competition even in the open source world. And if your open source product needs to succeed, you need to make sure that you are building the community, you're adequately creating documentation, making sure people are able to use it, right? And I've heard Silicon Valley companies and startups, um, you know, now uh, VCs are kind of doing more technical due diligence on how products are being built. You know, what level of sophistication do they have? Is it just a wrapper over an open source product or do they have engineered processes and how robust is the process in place? Because it's a huge risk aspect, right? So I think that's an important value proposition you can think about in terms of positioning your product itself. Because if you say your uh, product is mature, you demonstrate it by not only showing your product, but you also showcase all the use cases, all the testing you've done, what is all advertised. And I remember I used to work for a company called MathWorks and um, I joined the company um, after my tour of duty in the financial services company, wherein it was always like 60 hours running on coffee. I got to get the next thing done. And this was more of an engineering first company. And one of the most beautiful things that I put a link earlier just to kind of illustrate was there was a whole dedicated team of documentation specialists. Uh, most of them had PhDs and master's degrees who understood what they were documenting. That's the most important part. It was not meant to just fill in the blanks. They basically were taking time to articulate the use cases. And the reason why I mentioned that is the product's use cannot just be left to the end user. You have to guide the user for the best way of using your products, 
And I think that's documentation is the best way of doing it by illustrating use cases, examples, reusable templates, reusable pieces of code, so that you guide the user towards how to use your products optimally. And with usage comes adoption, with adoption comes maturity, and with all the that's how the companies will be able to succeed. So I think companies should acknowledge that you know documentation is an integral part of you educating your customer on the best way to use your particular products. Definitely agree with that. Um, I would add that frequently, especially I think in this domain, we talk about ethics as being a way of avoiding harm, um, but that's only one way of looking at ethics, right? There's um, a, lot of, a lot of perspectives on ethics advocate it for its own benefit, right? That like ethics, ethics is a good in its own right. Um, and if we're looking at it from a more managerial institutional logics, maybe, um, it's also worth noting that in many domains, consumers find ethics to be valuable for its own case, for its own sake as well. That they're more willing to, especially now as, um, or gonna scoot around, a specific thing. Let me try that again. Um, <laughs> uh, as people become more aware of, especially for example, social media companies and the impact that they have, they might they it may follow a similar path as we have in um, more tangible consumer products, where um, the responsible choice becomes a benefit to the customer, and the customer is willing to um, move to a more ethical option. And so uh, what I'm trying to avoid saying is that is framing ethics as primarily a branding decision, which I, cause I do not believe that, but it is part, that it does have an effect on branding. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Like, like I, I think we're just, we're just in this unfortunate but predictable place with machine learning as a, as, mostly a new technology. I, I want to emphasize, it, for some industrial sectors in the US, it's not a new technology at all. It's, it's old hat. They're, they're extremely mature in their use of it, and they can target it like a weapon. Um, but I, you know, outside of that, or, you know, the, the more wild west space, the, the level of hype is absurd. I, I, I don't know if airplanes or nuclear reactors or trains had the same level of hype. I mean, they, they likely did. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that's why I end up focusing on, on the risk and the harm so much, because it's like, I have to snap the people I'm working with out of this, like download Python, get a million dollars, get Google job mindset. Like, um, you know, people have to switch their mindset to prioritizing safety, prioritizing legality and compliance, prioritizing real world performance, not static test data performance, not Kaggle performance. It simply doesn't matter for anything. Um, and so I think once you, once you switch into this mindset um, where like if I was building an airplane or I was building a train, safety and compliance and legality would, would probably be the foremost requirements that I was trying to satisfy and real world performance would, would be molded into satisfying safety and legality requirements. Um, then, then I think that, you know, we build better models. We put ethics first. Or, or we at least give ethics a place. We build better models that satisfy real world constraints. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, this was a little convoluted, but I wanted to sort of second Karen's comments that, that ethics can be good on their own and can lead to better performing machine learning models. And then highlight the fact that the reason I, I drive home the negatives and the risk so often is just because the level of hype is so outrageous um, and, and also, you know, we've had new technologies before, right? We've, we've had new technologies before, um, and, and they always bring risk. And I think a, a lesson from history that we should all take note of is who is always harmed when new technologies are introduced. It's always people at the margins of society. It's always people who are already facing discrimination and data privacy and, uh, you know, and, and just general uh, discrimination in the real world, right? We know that's who's going to experience the harms when we, when we introduce a new technology. And so I think it's, 
it's incumbent on us all, especially as a profession of basically young liberal leaning practitioners to think about, you know, the hype around this new technology and who it's going to be harming. And documentation is just, again, a very general control to prevent those kinds of harms. And also, yeah, and I think one way that that happens is by bringing in other eyes, yes. right? People who don't have a the occupational or organizational cultural lens that's leading them to evaluate something a certain way. Um, legible documentation and public documentation can be read by other engineers, also their managers, um, citizens. If we, you know, if feel that that's important, regulators, all kinds of folks, and that that those additional eyes can bring a more well-rounded perspective on something. Hard agree. Yes, definitely see the importance of accessibility of, of those types of documents for sure. Um, and one final question for you all is, what would you like to see in the industry to enable successful ML documentation? Um, you know, how can organizations go about implementing documentation successfully? So I'll kind of give it a start and uh, uh, Karen, you, know, you should probably help us with, uh, you know, some of the ethics related frameworks which are out there. And I've kind of read some of it and I'm trying to see how that could be integrated uh, from an industry perspective because um, the financial services industry is where I predominantly focus on. Um, has use cases wherein machine learning is predominantly being used. So I think one of the one of the biggest chasms right now is like we have all these amazing technologies, but those were not designed for specific industries or use cases. So now everybody is taking these technologies and now they are applying it to specific use cases and saying, oh, this works, this doesn't work, right? So I think it has to be the other way around, wherein you know, we are basically having a particular use case and we are, you know, we know our statistics, we know the ways we could potentially model. Now, how can we leverage some of the newer technologies, potentially a deep neural network, potentially reinforcement learning application and see whether that particular thing uh, it, it works for our particular use case. So I think the context is the most important part because every brochure you see right now, you know, they kind of, you know, have like, you know, alternative data, machine learning, potentially also a blockchain because they're all marketing terms, which everybody, you know, uh, is going to be attracted towards. So I think one of the key things to note is the context, like, you know, it has to be industry specific. You cannot generalize a template and say everybody from a doctor to an engineer to a nuclear scientist should you know, take an eight by 10 because that's what is easily appealable to the community and say, this should be the format of use. So it has to be contextualized to the particular use case. Secondly, community building, because um, two examples, one on the financial services side, Patrick is a part of some of the efforts. So we have built out a consortium of practitioners um, in the industry. And we are talking about what are the best practices we have learned so far, you know, 15, 20 years of experience. We have built organizations, built departments. What has worked for us? Let's start from there rather than kind of saying, let's start something new, right? So leveraging the best practices. So in the financial services context, we have kind of formed this consortium wherein we are building out templates and white papers, which is going to come in the next year or so. Um, to kind of articulate how do we kind of document some of these aspects? How do we look at risk? How do we look at fairness? How do we look at explainability and build out this body of knowledge so that you can contextualize it? Uh, and I also, I think we got to get together because uh, I think World Economic Forum did out a survey a few uh, months ago and they mentioned that uh, when they did a research on number of, uh, I think they said ethics frameworks, there are like 175 of them. 175 published ethics frameworks, white papers and documents, you know, prescribing what ethics should look like. And many of them are not pragmatic. So I think we need to flip the question from an industry context. So what should an ethics framework for a hospital system look like? What should an ethics framework for, uh, uh, you know, financial industry look like? What should an ethics framework for? So I'm just speaking ethics, but it could be very, you know, specific to a particular industry, right? What should explainability look like? What should uh, fairness look like? So I think we should 
thematically look at industry specific aspects to make sure that we are kind of evolving a practice and best practices rather than kind of you know starting from here are all the features how do we adopt it for our particular use case this isn't a comprehensive answer but it's an example of an answer of a way that we can encourage adoption um, this is something by the way that we talk about with ethics but i think work translates very well to compliance with a documentation <coughs> policy or in you know seeing documentation as part of your job um, is to use organizational and cultural and culturation techniques right so you include it in your job description in your interview process in your evaluation right your job um, what do you call that review annual review type thing um, you include it structurally in meetings in however you're communicating tasks to people you consistently signal and hold accountable people to do the thing that you're asking them to do rather than just saying we value documentation and that being sort of the end of the story um organizations um you know actually i think probably that rather than the literature in my field um uh organizational culture would be a, a good place to to look at for ways of um because we you know organizations are highly motivated to build and convey and um reify organizational culture and this is that is one tool for um developing not just compliance but enthusiasm or um buy-in for programs like this so hard agree on Karen's point about incentives. You know, when I when I said there's doc, you know, there's data scientists today who are training some big important model inside of some big important bank, um, you know, that know they're going to have to write a lot of documentation. Yeah, they're evaluated, they're incentivized, and they're evaluated on on that as part of their job. And you know, so so just a realistic part of this is that organizations incentivize documentation and other risk controls for machine learning. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of my wish list, I, I want, um, I want regulation. I want U S federal regulation. Um, I want it to be good and common sense regulation. I don't want over regulation. Um, I in general do not, even though you will see these with my name on them, um, I do not particularly care for life cycle risk management. Okay, but risk management targeted at different aspects of an abstract computational process. I, I don't think we govern computers. We govern people. Um, the computers aren't making mistakes on their own. The computers are making mistakes because people told them to or people let them. Um, and so I, I would like to see sort of risk management frameworks um, coming out from leading organizations, including governments that, and, and I would point to SR 11.7 in the financial services industry um, as an example of this, I would, I want risk management frameworks that point the finger at people. We have to stop pretending that these computers are smarter than us. They're not, they're just faster than us. Um, and so I want, I want responsible regulation and decent governance frameworks from leading organizations um, and I want them to target the governance of people, not the governance of systems. I also don't want to hear anything about fully automated governance. That's perhaps the stupidest thing I've ever seen educated people write down. I'm fine with semi-automated governance. I'm, I'm fine with helping people generate documents. I'm fine with um, you know, using tools to make the governance processes more efficient. But the idea that a machine learning system can govern itself or that we have other computational systems that are capable of managing the context it requires to govern a machine learning system is frankly absurd. And I've seen leading organizations suggest this very recently, and I find it very bothersome. Just, just, to, just to add to what Patrick said, um, just to contextualize, we are not there yet. I mean, we should not pretend that AI is a solved problem and we are now just building engineering processes around something which we're gonna be using for the long run. You know, we are still evolving these processes, trying to figure out whether it's gonna add value. The most successes in the AI uh, space is predominantly decision support system. How can systems support human decision-making, right? 
not just humans delegating decision-making to machines. We probably will get there. I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime, but we will probably get there when systems are going to be doing end-to-end. -end, and then at that point, you have delegated everything to a system. You got to make sure that you're going to be governing every aspect of your system because that's going to be running your whole process. But today, there are so many places where humans are going to be in the loop. And, you know, we can use decision support. I mean, I'm not completely against like automating certain things. I mean, if, you know, creating a report and, you know, building out what you have been typing in a Jupyter notebook needs to be re-entered in another system, needs to be further entered into a database, needs to be published onto some kind of a site or people are talking about Confluence and other tools. So, okay, if we are putting up a lot of different things for humans to do, then it's a process destined for failure because no one's going to follow it. And then we'll end up with a suboptimal system. We have the infrastructure in place, but no one follows it, right? So I am fully there for automation and making templates available so that people can get started and automate the whole you know, uh, creation of certain kinds of artifacts, if you will. The decision-making cannot be automated. Basically having like 155 algorithms try out different combinations and saying, this is the best algorithm where an algorithm doesn't have any contacts is not the best way to choose a particular model, right? So the question becomes, how can you as a responsible organization think about your particular clientele, where this model is gonna be used and factor those in in the design of your system and leverage anything you can potentially enrich your system with automation because it's a decision support system. And we have always been automating things which were non-critical for us. And we felt that it was a repeatable process. I mean, you know, Patrick was mentioning about speed. I mean, if I'm asked to do data entry for 10,000 rows, oh my goodness, that's not gonna be something I, I'm gonna be incentivized even if you give me a really lot of money to be doing it 365 days a year. But throw in a system, Put in an OCR and then let the system do what it's supposed to do, and you can you can basically add search to it and do a lot of interesting things around it, right? So the question becomes of how do you articulate the values so that you can bring the humans and the machines together so that you can build more robust systems? I'd like to add to something that um, Patrick said about regulating people rather than regulating the technology itself. Um, sort of two points. One is to add to the list of where harm comes from. It does come from people telling systems to do the wrong thing. It also comes from, especially in the case of machine learning, the data, the place where we pull our data from is the real world. And the real world has social systems that are not equitable. Um, and harm can come from there. And it can be very opaque. It can be very difficult for people, for the, the humans who are involved to see that. I think that's an important thing to include in documentation processes is like have an eye on Where's this data coming from and what are what does equity look like or what does harm look like in that real world system? Um, so that would be one note. And the other thing is the US does have a, a consistent history of regulating technology rather than regulating people or regulating with the um, with values in mind. So a lot of the uh, example I always use for this is that a lot of the tech, a lot of the laws that we now rely on to regulate pr privacy are laws that were made for newspapers and VHS tapes, <laughs> like that, that isn't a, unlike right, the GDPR, for example, say what you will, I guess, I don't actually really have a strong opinion about it that's worth going over, but it's specific, it's, it's topic is privacy, not newspapers or social media, right? Um, so that's um, an approach that the US tends not to take, but is I think worth, highlighting as an option. Yeah, and I just want to add Can one I jump in on the, on the privacy point really quickly? Um, I would just add, and this is not a, this is not like a contestational comment. I would just add that, that data, that privacy and security are um, normative, okay? Most people can agree that privacy is good and security is good. So if we implement, privacy technology well, then we're probably going to enhance privacy and that's probably going to be good. If we implement security technology well, it's probably probably going to enhance security and that's going to be good. When we implement an AI system well, it can be something that helps people, 
or it can be something that does terrible harm. You know, to, and I, I use this example a lot. It's dramatic, but so forgive me. You know, if I can design an, uh, a robot that's intended person, you know, intended purpose is to walk down the street and shoot women. And all it does is walk down the street and shoot women and it never shoots men. It has perfect accuracy. It's been implemented perfectly well. Right. So so governance of AI requires somebody somewhere to take a normative stance and say that this technology shouldn't be used for harm and that using it for harm is bad. And so I just like to draw out that distinction when, when we talk about governance for privacy and security versus governance for AI. Privacy and security on their own are, are normative and good. AI on its own is neutral and can be used for good or bad. Yeah, we would make the analogy of something like fairness or equity, right? With privacy rather yes. than privacy compared yeah, to Yeah, and, and that was not like, I'm not saying you're wrong. I just saw oh, like, I'm, it's something I'm, I'm processing a lot recently, actually. And I think it's an important distinction to make. And one thing to add to that is uh, in the, when you talk about like governance, we are always honing in on what has been implemented, right? but we are completely ignoring this unknown unknowns because we don't know all the potential things which could potentially go wrong, right? So having good documentation will basically say, well, these are the things we have considered, but now if you have uh, you know, an independent third party come in and look at it, say, oh, you have you factored this additional thing that provides the impetus to factor these things which may not have been thought about in the context of the design of the system, right? And that's where, all these facets could come into place for it, either it's privacy, either it's security or marginalization of specific demographics, uh, fairness, explainability. Uh, if you tell concretely what the system is designed for and what are the use cases which it's designed for, now you're basically drawing the boundary that, well, this is what we have thought about and what we have implemented. But then now, if you're seeing these unknown unknowns, then you can say, okay, how can we safeguard ourselves for all these other potential scenarios and start making our system more robust? Thumbs up from Patrick. <laughs> um, yeah, I really like this emphasis on uh, regulating with people and values in mind rather than focusing explicitly on the technology. Well, I, I want to point out that we have to, because if we just tell people to implement AI systems well, like I said, it can be a robot that walks down the streets and shoots people really accurately. Like that's a well-implemented AI system. And so, so sorry to cut you off. I just feel like that's a really important point that, that comes up a lot in like, why is my model lifecycle management framework bad? Because because somebody, somebody somewhere has to be the adult in the room and say, this technology can't be used to enable harm. And, and so that is crucially important. Like AI on its own isn't normative. It can be good or bad. Somebody somewhere has to take about accountability to make it good or bad. And I'm gonna stop interrupting you and shut up, sorry. No, no worries. You didn't inter interrupt me at all, um, but 100% agree with that. Um, and that, that's it for the questions I, I had for our discussion. Thank you so much for um, all your insights and contributions. Um, I'll now move it over to the Q&A period. Uh, so again, if anyone has questions for our panelists, please uh, either place them in the chat or in the Q&A um, pop-up. Uh, there's already some in here, so I'll go ahead and read them out. Um, someone asked, uh, it's been a fairly common industry practice to deploy ML models at scale and say that they will improve over time as they learn. Would the push for documentation counter that trend or are they unrelated? Well, uh, let me take a crack at it. Um, we know that we don't have all the data and it's meant to improve as time goes. You know, when initially when the series and the Alexas came out, you know, they were not really, really good in understanding what we were asking it to do. And, you know, I have an Indian accent um, and I had to like be very clear and slow to tell my instructions for it to learn what I was expecting as an answer, right? But as we have provided more and more samples, the models have become better and better. And that's what's gonna happen with machine learning systems. But when you think about documentation, you're basically kind of 
factoring that in, but as the data comes in and as the model gets trained, you are going to be getting better results. And that's something which has been acknowledged. You know, you've tested it out and you build it out. So it's not totally unrelated, but you want to make sure that you kind of have that as a part of your design, that this is how the model is going to improve over time. And this is where there could be potential drifts. And this is where you want to make sure that um, you are going to be either retraining or you know, switching models or doing additional things. I, I hesitate to sound like I'm encouraging online, like live online learning in the real world for very many applications because I want to first say that, there, that one should hesitate. Um, but yes, one way of covering that is covering that possibility with documentation is to have documentation that is user facing, right? To say either when you're interpreting these results or when you're using this product, understand that there are some cases that may not be as accurate as others, right? And now again, people are not very good at understanding risk. Like even people who study risk are not good at understanding risk is- Even me, like, even me. Yeah, right, yeah, and that's basically what I'm trying to say, right? It's like, I work with statistics all day and I still am not good at like, in a human real world grounded way, understanding the implications of risk in, outside of numbers. And so I don't know how to convey that successfully, but that would be a, a direction to go with documentation. I don't know if I hedged that enough, but. I, I just say that that I think the, the questioner is is getting on to something like, like I just say like broadly documentation, as I've said, you know, a lot is just, it's, it's just this wide ranging risk control that, that could help you um, avoid all kinds of potential failures and attacks. Um, and, and I think it is right, right, and and that's what I said about like common sense regulation, and and it, it is true that like typically when we put a machine learning system out, we don't really have all the data that we know we need yet. You know, it, even if we're not doing you know reinforcement or online or adaptive learning, which I also would not do um, today. The you know it, it's still just true that like it's version one or version 0 0.1 of, of some piece of software and we're going to learn over time you know hey we should have used this data we could have used this data this feature will enhance the software and so it is true that these systems do tend to not perform as well at first and then for all kinds of reasons not even related to math they, they do end up performing better um, over time if they're properly governed. Okay, so I, th I think that's how I wanna frame my answer is that if you truly want your systems to perform better over time, then document them and apply common sense governance. Yeah. And just to just kind of reiterate that point, especially when you are working with beta software, you need to have more documentation, not less documentation. Because if you do not know what the model is gonna do, then you should basically put in similar to what you would do in terms of you know any other beta product right you put in this whole list of if you buy a drug and you look at the document for the drug and the drug has been tested for x number of people the potential harms and risks there is a whole section that it may cause all these other potential scenarios so we probably need to think about well the model has been thought about to work in these particular scenarios but here are all the potential things that could go wrong and that needs to be documented more adequately rather than just kind of saying well let's kind of hold off on getting to a particular place before we write proper documentation we do there i've noticed a pattern in the world of just slapping the word beta on something and being like well you know that that means like people will understand what that means that means the user accepts the risk that means we don't have to document it well or make any real commitments to improve it necessarily and we'll just be in beta indefinitely and people will use our product and like there is something to be said for one reason aside from math that performance can improve is because people get used to using it and, and, and like adapting to its weaknesses um and any way to signal like this thing isn't perfect is useful but avoiding documenting things because you're in beta or whatever is like not something i would recommend or yeah, the, the very first thing that should be documented is what this what what's your intended use and what are the intended benefits, and that should be very clear before hands ever go to keyboards. Okay, um, I know we only have around ten minutes left, so I'm going to try and get through as many questions as I can. Uh, 
There's another one here which asks, uh, in the recent EU AI Act proposal, technical documentation and record keeps are required by law for all high risk applications and subject to ex ante conformity assessment. Are you aware of any standards or certification framework being developed for documentation or record keeping for this purpose? Um, well, in, in, so, um, in the European AI Act, document two, annex four, is a documentation template. And so I would, I, I, I don't know if the person who wrote this question was aware of that or not. And, and um, if you haven't spent much time with the EU AI Act, I, I would go to the annex documents. Um, and again, remember we were saying documentation helps people follow processes. And so the documentation template that is um, document two, Annex four of the EU AI Act is a very good documentation template. So, so I would suggest that as a, as a great place to get started. I would suggest model cards as a good place to get started. And, and I'd say most appropriate for low risk use cases. Um, and I'd also point to uh, SR 11.7 and recent guidance, you know, recent more detailed guidance from the US Office of the controller of the currency um, that, that also lays out what should be required in model documentation. So first, yes, it's still evolving what should be in model documentation and it will probably continue to evolve for a long time, but are there established standards? Also, yes, um, the, the three big ones that come to mind are, are model cards, SR 11.7, which I'll, I'll put that PDF in the in the Slack and just in the chat in just a second. And then the, the uh, document two, annex four of the EU AI Act is a very good documentation template. Yeah, I just wanna add a couple of things to that. Uh, Patrick, thanks for sharing those. Um, I wanna caution that any of these templates which have been written by anybody without context should not be your standard template. You gotta always choose a template based on your context because you are not gonna be just writing and fill in the blanks for someone else. You're writing the documentation for your organization, for your purpose of use. Someone who wrote a template will not have that context, right? So a template is an example of how you can potentially start with documentation. And that's where you gotta start with, you know, understanding your use case really, really well. And the model car or the data nutrition label or some of the nexus which Patrick was mentioning are great places to start because if you do not have anything, that's a great place to start. But uh, please, please, please don't just automate that and say, okay, this is what was recommended. I've seen incarnations of some of these standard templates in multiple commercial websites, and they have absolutely no clue on how I'm going to be using this particular computer vision model. This computer vision model was trained on you know, 50,000 images of 17 different classes, and it takes this as an input and this as an output, and this is the model card. That's a great technical description of the model. So it's like basically taking, going to Home Depot and looking at the description of what a screwdriver is. And that doesn't mean that I'm gonna be using the screwdriver to be using on my computer, or I'm gonna be like, you know, you know, using it for building out my furniture. It doesn't have that specific context yet. So when you are putting your recipe on how are you going to be disassembling your MacBook, then you got to be extremely careful in selecting the right screwdriver, making sure that you provide the specific instructions on how you're going to be disassembling it and putting it into context. And I think that's important. And that's something I don't think we have standards or, you know, processes yet. Yeah. And I would add that just because, um, you, your organization has adopted a particular template that is useful for your context and other people agree on. I, I see in the um, chat, we're talking about data sheets and model cards we have discussed here too. Um, those are useful for different points in the pipeline as well, right? Like data sheets are about training data and model cards are about models um, that we shouldn't require of a template that it is useful for every single use case and covers the entire documentation need for an organization. And I do worry somewhat as much as I do support, just to be super clear, I do support policies either at an industry level or at a national or global level or whatever it is to support the use of documentation. But that I would be concerned 
that doing that, we would need to mitigate the risk of people saying, oh, I, you know, I fulfilled the requirements of the law or of the, the professional industry policy, um, and I no longer need to, I just don't, because it doesn't include training data documentation, I don't have to include training data documentation. That, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. And so like, I'm a big, and, and you know, there, there are um, people in the, uh, you know, chat that I recognize that I'm kind of chatting with here who know that I'm a big proponent of, of SR 11.7, but any of this can de devolve to rubber stamping, right? Any, any governance activity can devolve to rubber stamping. And so that's why, again, it really comes down to do people care or not. It, it's really quite that, you know, it's really quite simple. And so, you know, I see uh, comments about licensing and education in the chat, like that's, that's right on too. Um, people, you know, just have to be educated about the educational risk and the harms that these technology, um, the ethical, you know, the ethical risk and the, the harms that these technologies can cause um, so that they care whether they're hurting people or not. And, you know, and, and I think very fundamentally, it's going to come down to that because I don't think we're going to get U.S. federal regulation anytime soon. Um, and, and states are regulating. States are regulating. So if you're an abuser of AI, watch out for, you know, essentially blue states. Um, but, but again, I think a, a fundamental thing here is that people just have to care. The computers don't care and the computers don't understand. Yeah. I think one example of why that is the case is what something we talked about earlier and that th there's a certain amount of what some people would call moral imagination, but you can maybe limit that to just think about imagination, right? Creatively thinking about how someone else might use or misuse your data and you a person needs to be legitimately sincerely engaged in the project of imagining in order to do that well. And so I, it's sort of like, I guess I would say a yes and in terms of policy and enculturation in um, to support documentation. But right, right. So yeah, right. And so I get, just to be really clear, what I'm saying is people have to care to make documentation like that. That's, that's all like that. That's the fundamental thing here. And, and Otherwise, right, it's just rubber stamping and, you know, it's, but, but I'm, I'm going to hush up. Yeah, so, I mean, when it comes down to documentation, my biggest challenge when I work with companies is everyone wants to do the minimum absolutely necessary. And they always start with, is there a regulatory requirement? And is there something, someone's going to ask us that, have you done this? And I think that's probably not the best place to start because ultimately, you know, the frameworks you're building, the documentation you're building is going to help you create a robust process for your organization. It's not about just having someone else certify what you're doing is right or wrong. So um, I'm just kind of, you know, reiterating what I said before. Um, without context, doesn't matter whatever you have followed and you know, put together as documentation because no one's going to use it. You know, you'll have to spend it all the time. It's going to be absolutely useless that you'll have a bunch of artifacts and you may even clear certain regulatory hurdles, mm -hmm. but it's not going to really matter ultimately if you're spending all the time and haven't really connected with the people, the culture, and the, the core users of uh, why that was required in the first place in your organization. Hey, um... Sarah, I can give a really quick answer to this uh, question from Michael Simon or a really quick comment, it just just because I see we're running out of time. So yeah, I'll say I'll say on the killer robots comments, yes, they are exaggerated, but it was it has been documented in the New York Times that one country used an AI enhanced weapon to carry out a political assassination in another country, you know, just just in the last few months. Um, and, and, you know, it, from from that account of it, it's pretty clear that that the assassination wouldn't have taken place without the sort of AI enhancements. And in, in, uh, it was an AI enhanced machine gun or an AI enhanced sort of um, uh, sniper rifle or something like this. And you can read about it in the New York Times. So I admit killer robots are a, are a dramatic example, but they're not unreal. Great, thank you for addressing that. And uh, I think we will wrap up now as we're two minutes away from the hour, but uh, thank you to all of our panelists today for, for coming and contributing your 
thoughts. It's been such a lively discussion. Um, I have really enjoyed it. I hope that our attendees have really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm just sharing a link in the chat right now um, for folks to register to stay up to date with the About ML work and future events that we will be putting on. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for coming. <laughs>